Hello, and welcome to Mindful Biology. This is the third of five sessions about fluidity. We're looking at the flow of life, how we feel it in our bodies, how it affects our relationships, and as we observe it in the natural world. We're also looking at trauma and how it can restrict our natural fluidity. And of course, we're going further to see how we can soften the rigidity caused by trauma and once again, creatively engage the flow of life with zest. In this talk, we're focusing on the mammalian body, as I call it. This is that body of experience closely connected with our anatomy and physiology as mammals. And so it's also closely connected with our mammalian emotions. And we'll be looking in particular at those emotions that give us signals about whether we feel supported and connected to others or whether we feel unsupported and alone. We'll see how the long evolutionary history of mammals as supportive organisms can be leveraged as we work to overcome some of our trauma habits and restore natural fluidity in our lives. We saw last time how when the mammalian body is viewed through the lens of objectification, that there is a kind of interplay between what we think about the body, the ideas we have about it, what we think about the world and our circumstances, and what we feel in the mammalian experience. So the example was of somebody that gets some distressing news, feels anxious in the body, a sense of fluttering perhaps or sinking, interprets that as confirmation of how scary the news is, and thinks increasingly negative thoughts about whatever is on the mind. Those negative thoughts are felt in the body as higher levels of agitation, fear, and so on, which of course drive more negative thinking, and the cycle goes on and on and creates this experience that we tend to refer to as suffering. Now we also saw it last time that we can use that same power of objectification to create a sense of distance from our mental and bodily experience, to adopt a witnessing stance, which provides a quality of spaciousness around whatever troubling feelings and ideas we have in our system. So this is a general theme as we work with the different so-called bodies of experience. Each is capable of contributing to suffering, and each is capable of being employed in service of equanimity. In the next two talks, we'll move on to discuss the cellular and universal bodies. We'll find that these bodies, because they're less affected by day-to-day -day ups and downs of circumstance, tend to be more natural regions of our experience in which to find a feeling of equanimity and ease. And yet, even though they are less affected by our daily fears and frustrations and so on, they can in various ways feed into suffering themselves. So there's always this capacity to go one direction or the other, and our task is to feel into our experience moment by moment and choose where in our bodies to find the capacity to cultivate greater equanimity to soften our experience of suffering. So sometimes that'll mean feeling into the mammalian qualities of direct emotional and bodily experience. Sometimes it'll mean feeling into the cellularity and its vibrating energetic feel. Sometimes it will mean feeling how the body is in fact limitless and seamlessly embedded in a vast and organic cosmos. And sometimes it will be using our capacity to objectify, to look at the body conceptually and find ease in that way. So we're always choosing the path within the bodily experience 
which serves equanimity and which softens suffering. At least you know, that's what we would be choosing in the ideal. Of course, in reality, we have to work with our current state of conditioning, our current abilities, and so on. So as mentioned today, we'll be focusing on the mammalian body, this body of warm, furry life. You'll recall from last time that a lot of what we feel in the body is mediated by a conversation between the emotional regions of the brain, the so-called limbic system, and the vital organs in the body core, the viscera. These viscera and the limbic system that talks to them are very characteristic of mammalian organisms. Many of the vital organs are, of course, shared by reptiles and fish and birds, but our makeup is predominantly mammalian in every sense. And because of that, we share some important characteristics with mammals, some of which I've mentioned. One is the furriness or hairiness of the body. Another is the so-called warm-bloodedness, maintaining a constant body temperature. Another is the development in a womb or uterus, which is true of virtually all mammals, that we develop in the womb and have this profoundly intimate connection with the mother's body through the placenta and umbilical cord. And that intimate connection continues even after we've left the uterus and the umbilical cord has been severed as we suckle at our mother's breast. So all of those features are shared by mammals, and we have them deeply embedded in our physiology and in our evolutionary memory. Now you'll notice that in this picture, these two lemurs, these two mammals, primates, you can see the eyes facing forward, uh, looking a little bit human-like, that these animals are close together. They're in close contact. And because we're born within the body of another being, and we suckle at the breast of another being, and we require care from other beings when we're little and helpless, we come to expect as mammals that others will be there to support and nurture us. Thus, for mammals, a lot of what we experience as suffering is the result of a lack of the expected support. So when we need someone to be there for us, and it seems as if no one is, that triggers a lot of what we experience as suffering. And of course, this can take some subtle forms in the case of humans with our intense sociality. It can be, you know, a verbal slight that feels like a rejection. It can be a delay in returning a text or phone call, you know, that we expect from a friend, etc. But those sorts of experiences where we feel socially isolated or rejected are the ones that are most capable of causing what we call suffering. In contrast, feelings of ease are likely to arise when we feel supported by somebody we trust and like and so on. Now, I've put this over on the side of equanimity, but in reality, true equanimity is not something that's dependent on the right person being close to us at the right time. True equanimity is something that we can learn to tap into even when we're more isolated. One way we can do this is to really feel into the mammalian body and how it has a kind of tuning that expects close comfort and we can recreate that sense of comfort even when we're alone with the power of our mind and our memory, etc. And we'll be looking at how that's done in this talk. So a lot of what we feel, as has been said, is something that we feel in the body. And it's a mammalian body with all of the mammalian expectations. So let's look at those in a little more depth. So here we see some deer. These are animals that live in groups. And you can see how they're together. And as the adults move by and start to head off in another direction, the young follow in order to stay with the group and feel safe and connected and supported. They congregate in the middle of the group often, getting the protection of the larger adults and the comfort of their nearness to others. Same with these little burrowing animals. They're spending time together 
and they nuzzle together occasionally and groom each other. All of these behaviors are unremarkable to us. We're very used to the idea that mammals behave this way. But what we may not remember is that we evolved with exactly these tendencies to be social, to be connected to others in a warm, body-to-body -body way. This is especially obvious during birth. So here's a mother dog giving birth to her puppies. And so one has already been born, another's on its way out, and you can see as we watch her what an intimate and nuzzling and snuggling and sniffing process this is with all sorts of licking and tenderness. And she actually is aiding the little puppy in coming out of her reproductive tract. At times, she tugs it to help lift it free. And so the little puppy emerges and she licks off all the membranes and the mucus until it takes its first breath. And each of us came into the world in exactly this way. I mean, a different kind of body, but the birth process was effectively the same. And even if we were born by cesarean, our entire evolutionary history has prepared us for this kind of birth with all this intimacy, all this contact. And so this is built into us as mammals, as is the desire to be close to others, to feel safe and comforted. So this is part of our heritage in an evolutionary sense, as well as in a personal sense. All of us were supported at some point during childhood, or we wouldn't have made it to adulthood. And so we have these memories of closeness, support, contact, etc. And we confront and center that mammalian heritage, which I like to think of as a kind of optimism, that the mammalian body expects closeness and contact with safe and supportive others. And again, much of what we call suffering is due to the frustration of that optimistic expectation. And so we can focus rather than on the frustrating part, on the optimistic part. Like this is a body that knows contact. Even when we're isolated from others physically or emotionally, within the body is the personal and evolutionary memory of closeness and contact and love and support. And we can tap into that using our consciousness, using our intelligence, using our capacity to direct attention with mindfulness. So this mammalian optimism has a lot to do with our experience early in life as infants. There's the birth experience discussed already, and then, of course, there's the nursing experience, suckling at the mother's breast. In an earlier talk, I pointed out how the fluidity of our mammalian lives is on view here in two senses. One is the fluidity of bodily liquid, in this case, milk. So just as there's the liquid blood circulating through both mother and baby bodies, there's liquid milk passing between them. Very much about flow and fluidity. But there's also an emotional flow going on. As mother gazes at baby, baby gazes back, and their facial expressions resonate, and there's contact and touch and warmth and odors and all of this, this emotional intimacy, connection, what we call in other words, love is flowing back and forth between them. Again, very fluid. I want to focus for most of this talk on that emotional flow, but we'll return to the liquid flow toward the end. So to get a sense of this emotional flow, let's look at this mother with her baby. She's a singer, and as she sings to him, you'll see that he responds differently to different types of singing. What's important, I believe, in this video is how freely his emotions flow and how she supports and encourages that emotional expression with lots of excitement and comfort and reassurance. Okay, so my son, who is super happy all the time, ow, 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 and loves when I sing, he loves heavy metal. 
Giro, giro, tondo, casca y mondo. So we can see the emotions. Cascapetera. See them flow. <laughs> okay, that should like terrify a baby, but not George. But when it comes to opera, he gets super emotional and upset. Ave Maria. Sorry for that experiment. But seriously, every baby should be terrified by heavy metal. Gira gira tondo! Casca y mondo! I get the sense watching this mother interact with her child that when this young one reaches adulthood, there will be ready access to a wide range of emotional experience so that this person as an adult will be able to engage life with greater vibrancy and authenticity than those of us who perhaps didn't get the same level of emotional encouragement and support, which is to say those of us who may have experienced some degree of trauma. As I've said in earlier talks, the effect of trauma is to create a kind of rigidity. And in the case of emotional expression, it confines us to a narrower range of emotional availability than we might otherwise enjoy. In my case, this tends to be a chronic and habitual melancholy, so that I walk around with a slightly sad voice, a rather flat facial expression, looking less than fully vibrant and joyful and engaged, even when I'm enjoying myself. Others may lock into a forced smile, presenting a kind of happy face at all times, regardless of what's really going on inside and how much distress might be felt. I don't think it matters all that much what the exact emotion is that's allowed and which emotions are excluded. The problem is the rigidity itself, the restriction from the full range. And meeting the world with a restricted range of emotional availability to others and emotional awareness in ourselves saps a lot of the creativity and joy that might otherwise be available to us. And while some people are traumatized in a very obvious and intense way with major bereavement or abuse or neglect, most of us have experienced some milder form of traumatic or at least less than optimal support and encouragement in childhood. So this book by Gabor Mate, The Myth of Normal, Trauma, Illness, and Healing in a Toxic Culture, makes the case that the vast majority of us, just by virtue of living in our current civilization, are not raised to feel comfortable with all our emotions, to be truly authentic to our inner value system, and so on. I highly recommend this book. Uh, he's a well-known author who's written about addiction and other issues. Uh, he's also a physician. But the point is that all of us probably have at least some trauma rigidity built into us, either from early life experiences or uh, the later difficulties of living in a highly competitive and relatively unsupportive civilization. Now, we don't want, of course, if we can help it, to remain locked into our trauma rigidity forever. And fortunately, there do appear to be some strategies we can use to loosen the chains. One I introduced last time, and that's paying some attention to what is it that we play in the so-called theater of our mind. Are we always thinking about traumatic events, either recent or remote, or fearful thoughts about what might happen in the future? If so, that's clearly going to affect our emotional experience and will contribute to rigidity of response. In contrast, if we make an effort to remember happier times, to visualize more pleasant and supportive experiences, our physiology will respond likewise. And rather than being caught in those negative cycles that we saw, we'll start to break free of the negativity and begin to feel more at ease and more equanimous. 
So I mentioned last time that we can call up memories from our past when we were holding a loved one or petting a beloved animal or locked in a very intimate and passionate embrace or having fun and close contact as children or even suckling at our mother's breast or perhaps holding a beloved infant. All of these experiences that each of us has had some during our lives, we can bring these memories into consciousness and use them at times to cultivate a sense of inner safety and inner support. So for instance, we could imagine walking with a beloved grandparent. Now, we might have a memory of walking in a forest with our grandfather, or we might not. But we certainly remember, you know, if we had a good relationship with our, our grandfather, as I did, I remember my grandfather very well. I don't think I have precise memories of walking in woods with him, although I'm sure we did that. And so I can imagine being with my grandfather in the woods, even though the memory itself of being in the woods with him may be hazy or non-existent. In other words, I can use my imagination to build up what it was like to be with my grandfather and add to my stock of experiences with him. We could actually get creative with this memory process. We could imagine living in a time prior to civilization when we were in small tribes and villages, staying with the same people throughout our entire lives, feeling supported and known and loved by them. We could imagine a time that was closer to our evolutionary tuning, living with that kind of ongoing support from people who have always known us. And even if we've had some conflict with them, we understand they will always be there for us. If we wanted to get very creative, we could imagine being another type of animal, maybe something still vaguely human-like uh, in appearance, but with a completely different type of body and perhaps imagining what it might be like to be a furry creature snuggling in this little group that we see here. The power of memory and imagination is quite vast. So brain scanning has shown that regardless of whether we are living an experience in the current moment, remembering a past experience, or imagining an experience that might never have occurred, we use many of the same brain regions. So for instance, if I'm looking at visual scenery now, my visual regions in my brain light up. But if I imagine a visual scene that I was viewing long ago, perhaps standing at the rim of the Grand Canyon, my visual regions will still light up. And if I imagine a scene that never actually occurred in my experience, say, standing on the ice fields of Antarctica, and if I build out a visual imagination of what that would perhaps be like, my visual regions will similarly light up. Thus, the message that the body gets and that the emotional regions of the brain gets can be similar regardless of whether we're living through something now, remembering a positive past event, or imagining a situation where we felt supported and loved. This shows us the power of imagination and memory. We can even use a little more objective thinking and recall all of the evolutionary closeness, all of the births, all of the copulations, all of the maternal care that's part of mammalian evolution. So our entire heritage going back one to 200 million years was based on that kind of close, supportive, intimate contact. And even today, all the animals alive have benefited from that kind of warm contact. And many humans right now are experiencing it. So no matter how much distress we may feel or how much we read about in the news that looks troubling, all of the mammalian experience has been built around this expectation of closeness and support, which enables the order of mammals to survive and has enabled us as individual humans to likewise survive. We can also feel directly into that mammalian optimism mentioned earlier. There is a sense in which the body is hopeful about contact 
and has an inbuilt experience of it that we inherited as a kind of evolutionary memory. And of course, we also have our own personal stock of close and supportive experiences. And we can feel directly into the mammalian body and its sweetness and its hopeful expectation of being supported. So that gives a little overview of emotional flow and how we can encourage it after it's been uh, stunted a bit by traumatic experience. Let's look a little now at the more liquid aspects of flow in the mammalian body. So clearly the flow of blood is very important and a good example of fluidity. So this will probably be a review, but blood leaves the left side of the heart, travels through large vessels to capillary beds throughout the muscles and the organs of the body, passes through the capillaries and releases oxygen and nutrients into the cells of the body and picks up carbon dioxide and waste products, travels back to the heart through veins, and then is pumped out the right side of the heart to the lungs where it passes through a different set of capillaries where oxygen is absorbed and carbon dioxide is released. So the blood is now fully loaded again with oxygen after passing through the lungs and then it returns to the heart and the cycle continues. So there are two circulations, one through the body and one through the lungs. Of course, there isn't just one capillary bed in the body, there are many. We can divide them into two categories for our purposes. There is the set of capillaries that serve the large muscle groups and the set of capillaries that serve the viscera. And our body is capable of preferentially shunting blood toward one or the other. And that shunting is to a large degree under the control of the emotional limbic brain. We can imagine it having a kind of dial that it can turn, either to send blood over to the large muscles in order to prepare us to fight or flee or do something vigorous, and to effect that shunting, it relies on the sympathetic nerves we saw last time and the so-called stress hormones such as cortisol and epinephrine, otherwise known as adrenaline. And that provides it mechanisms by which it can control where the blood flows. At other times when there's no immediate threat or no need for vigorous activity, the dial goes the other way and blood is directed toward the digestive system and to the liver and kidneys to clean the blood and to the immune system to fight illness and to all the reparative functions. And this depends on output through the so-called parasympathetic system that we reviewed last time, as well as neurochemicals such as oxytocin and endorphins that give us a feeling of closeness to others, a sense of ease and harmony and, and safety. So there's this intelligence in the body that directs where everything goes according to its own intuition about what's needed in a given moment. And usually this works pretty well, but sometimes the intuition can get sidetracked particularly when there has been trauma. And then the response of the body may not be appropriate to the present moment, but be, may be more in line with events of the past. In other words, there's a sense in which we hold within us the trauma of early life and continue to live from that trauma, even in adulthood, even when the traumatic rigidity that served us as children no longer does so. And so this trauma is an overlay on top of what should be a free-flowing system that organically and spontaneously moves blood to muscles and then to large organs and back to muscles and so on according to circumstance. Instead, we get locked into a situation where perhaps there's some problem with digestion because the blood flow isn't as optimal as it could be. There's tightness and spasm in the muscles because they're continually activated and so on. 
So that trauma lives with us and can be something that we're only vaguely aware of and yet which is affecting our, phys our physiology. These memories can be very deep, even unconscious, some of them having formed before we developed the capacity for conscious memory as toddlers. And they can be overlooked and repressed, but they do color our ongoing experience of life. And of course, we would like to soften this rigidity. And what's needed is the same kind of emotional support and comfort that we saw with the mother who was helping her little baby experience a range of emotional response to different songs. We need that kind of close contact, that holding of another safe and supportive being. Well, of course, that may not always be available to us. If we can turn to a loved one who will hold us and comfort us, of course, that is terrific. But we do have options even when that's not available to us. Because the brain and what we call our heart, our emotional heart, form a complex of intelligence that in Eastern traditions is often referred to as the heart-mind. We could call it the heart-brain if we wanted. But this is our organic animal intelligence. We could call it our mammalian intelligence that allows us to use our capacity of memory and imagination and bodily experience and bodily ability to change our sense of being traumatized and rigid into one of being safe, supported, and free to flow with life in a more fluid and less rigid way. So we can draw on the mammalian optimism that's bequeathed by our long evolutionary past as mammals. We can draw on our personal store of pleasant memories. We can build up memories uh, out of imagination if we wish. And we can feel into the mammalian optimism of our organism, of our body, with all of its warmness and visceral feelings and expectation of nearness, contact, and support. So we can meet the world as it swirls through time with harsh and pleasing circumstances coming and going, using the power and intelligence of our heart brain to fluidly expand our repertoire and gradually increase our capacity to live with more equanimity and ease. What can help in this is beginning to feel more into our animal nature. This is, I think, the true value of the mammalian body that yes, the conceptual thinking mind has lots of power, but the body has lots of life and lots of intuition and lots of wisdom. I haven't actually read this book yet, although I intend to, but its title says what I'm trying to convey, which is that there is an animal within us and that that animal is ancient and has capacities that we are only dimly aware of. And we can begin to feel into our animal intelligence and our animal capacities. When we want to get more in touch with the animal nature that is within us, it helps to consider how animals behave in the wild. When they're not under stress, there's a fluidity, a playfulness, a grace, and a power in their movements and interactions. There's also an intuitive wisdom on display that comes from living in an environment for which the organism has been tuned by evolution. We can tap into all of those qualities by feeling into the mammalian body, feeling its wisdom, its strength, its creativity, its playfulness, and its optimism. And so we can live in the environment that we now find ourselves in, as different as it is from the environment for which we were tuned, and still find equanimity and ease. So that's just you know one of countless examples of how easy and fluid life can be when we can connect with our animal nature 
and move away from the rigidity of past traumas, rigid thinking, rigid emotional patterns, etc. We can rely on the power of our heart, mind, this vast animal intelligence to meet life with greater fluidity and ease. As we near the end of this third of five sessions about fluidity, I want to emphasize the importance of following the viewing of this video with some time devoted to bringing the ideas presented into your direct experience so that they move below the level of conceptual understanding into something we could call an embodied knowing. This can be done with a sitting practice of mindfulness or contemplation. But because we've been talking about trauma, it will be especially helpful if you incorporate some gentle movement. You might adapt some simple yoga poses or some Qigong movements, but you could also simply dance in a free-form way, in a space where you feel safe and able to express yourself and express your body with freedom. In the next two sessions, we'll talk about the so-called cellular and universal bodies, which will continue to help us feel the fluidity of life and find ways to soften whatever rigidity our individual traumas have caused.